Hey guys, my name is Kate Libby. I am the uh, author of Chesapeake Oysters, the Bay's Foundation and Future. And I'm here to tell you all about the Oyster Wars, uh, a really fascinating chapter in Maryland and Chesapeake history that I bet you didn't know anything about. So sit back, hopefully throw back a few oysters and a cold beer and let me tell you a little story about the Oyster Wars. So hang on one second and I'm gonna get my uh, presentation up. Okay. So, little background. Um, this is all taking place immediately after the Civil War, but before the turn of the century. So this is an incredible time of innovation and transformation in the Chesapeake Bay, all because of technology. Um, you know, really around like the turn of the 18th to the 19th century, there was oystering in the Chesapeake. There'd been oystering for millennia, but there was no way to preserve oysters or really get them anywhere. Um, we didn't have any methods to preserve oysters besides pickling, which I do not recommend. Um, although George Washington really liked it. So what happens is the new technology of canning is introduced to America from the French and then it goes to New York and it's brought to Baltimore by New York uh, oyster interests who are interested in accessing the very bountiful oysters of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and this happens at the perfect time because lo and behold, uh, Baltimore has also developed the new technology of railroads. So add that with these incredibly sort of plentiful oyster stocks and this other technology that came from New England, these big oyster dredge boats, and you've got what creates what we call the oyster boom. All right, so let's talk about the oyster boom and how it created the oyster wars. Okay, so in this image, you can see, you know, these fleet of skipjacks. And imagine the fleets of skipjacks and bug eyes um, and other really large sailing bateau that are har out harvesting oysters and bringing them into, you know, huge packing plants, not just in Baltimore, but in Solomon's, in Cambridge, in St. Michael's, in Oxford, um, in Crisfield, all over the Chesapeake, you know, the, the industry around the oyster uh, industry is really booming and exploding. Um, and of course, if you've been to the BMI, then you've seen some of the exhibits there uh, that talk about these sort of industrial packing facilities and how they hired immigrant workers or they hired recently emancipated African Americans. And, you know, this is, you had towns like Crisfield that it was like literally built on oyster shells and so this there's so much money to make in this time period that you know as you can imagine there's just it's opportune for conflict you know there's just tons and tons of money if you can get out there if you can oyster then you can make a mint and you could make a fortune now the state had attempted to regulate the oystering industry when in 1865 right after the civil war it you know set up a whole licensing system so you have all these you know, people coming back from the Civil War, this is a way to have jobs, but they wanted to set up some type of regulation. And the idea was that they wanted to protect shallow waters for tongers. And tongers are the people in the, in the left-hand photo. So they're going out in smaller boats, they're harvesting, you know, 20 bushels of oysters a day. It's a much smaller venture. And largely, this is something that's done by poorer people or by African-Americans who were often prevented from getting loans to get bigger boats. Now, on the right hand side, we have an image of an oyster dredge being used on a skipjack or a bug eye, a really large oyster fishing vessel. And these uh, bug eyes and skipjacks, they had to use what was known as sort of county waters or state waters. Um, state waters were specifically it's deeper water, you know, where you could go out and harvest more oysters. But then county waters were to be limited to only tongers with the idea that, you know, they would have shallow water oysters available to them within reach of their tongs. The problem is, is that A, oysters were worth so much money and you could make, you know, so much money off of them. And to get to the deeper water, you had to get over the shallower water. So there's going over those county waters. If you were a dredger, you might drop your dredge and then you might do it more regularly. And then somebody else sees you doing it and they start doing it. And so what you have is basically, and the initial conflict is not between regulators and, and you know, oystermen, it's between oystermen versus oystermen. What happens is these tongers are like, hey, those are our oysters. And they start, you know, getting rifles and shotguns and taking pot shots whenever they see these skipjacks, especially skip, get, skipjack captains would go out at night. These oystermen would go out at night to harvest under the cloak of darkness so that they could go out and harvest as many oysters as they wanted. So you have these gun battles 
breaking out of all these like, you know, not just Baltimore, but all over the Chester River and the Chop Tank River and the Potomac and anywhere that you had these like big oyster populations, you have immediate conflict. And so this conflict is happening so much that it starts getting picked up in national headlines. Um, and they're not, you know, if you think like, okay, okay, oyster poachers, you know, that's, that's not so great. Now, if you're a newspaper man, you're like, I want to sell newspapers. How do I do it? These are oyster pirates. And the conflict, it's not just, you know, inter oystermen conflict, it's the oyster wars. And so this that starts getting picked up by national level newspapers across the United States, what to do about it. So in 1865, when they set up all these regulations, the idea was they were all supposed to be enforced by one, one body, that's called the State Fishery Force, which would become known as the Oyster Navy. And on the right hand side, this is Hunter Davidson. He is the head of the Maryland Oyster Navy, the State Fishery Force, and he is at his wit's end. It's gotten so bad with the conflicts between a lot of these, you know, individual oystermen and, and smaller vessels and larger vessels that the state fishery force has gotten involved. And what happens then? Well, then the oystermen retaliate against the state fishery force, especially the captains of these larger vessels that were going out and harvesting illegally in the shallower waters. They had also started to devise some of these new techniques where Oystermen would work together in these large bands of pirates and they would sit at the mouths of waterways so that a couple could go out at a time and keep a lookout while the rest of them were further up the river and harvesting as many oysters as they wanted. So if a state fishery force steamer happened to come up the river, then they would alert all the other ones and then the ones that were keeping watch might, you know, start take opening fire at the state fishery force. So that and they only really had a couple vessels to begin with. So Hunter Davidson in 1877 goes in front of the state legislature to beg for more vessels, to beg for more support, more crew, more people to be out there managing these lawless fisheries that were just, you know, you, people were getting killed every day. Gun battles were breaking out all the time. And it's, you know, there were casualties of these, you know, this bitter conflict. So he ends up um, in this time period actually uh, lobbying for and getting um, a bunch of new vessels, including the McLean, a vessel, a steamer um, that now is, you know, off the, the water, the water line there at the Baltimore Museum of Industry. So he's successful. But one of his first conflicts is in 1877 on the Chester River. And what happens is, and this is such a great story. So there's one guy, Gus Rice, who's the head of this band of oyster pirates and he's notorious he's a fighter he's a brawler and you know he's always looking for a loophole so he's there at the mouth of the chester river and he's waiting for the state fishery force and he sees a steamer coming up the river and so he and his band of pirates just open fire on this thing it turns out it's just a passenger steamer full of women and children and they're screaming and crying and you know they're hitting the deck and uh, he realizes he made his mistake, but it was too late. And the news gets back to Hunter Davidson, who decides that he's going to send the McLean out to deal with this issue. And so he sends the McLean out. And as you can see in some of these images, it's, you know, it's nighttime and they're headed up the Chester River and they come into this band. It's a, it's a rafted up uh, entire sort of floating flotilla of, of skipjacks and bug eyes and oyster boats. And they've got metal plates on the, the bow of their ships all connected with the idea that every, you know, all the crew could get hunker down behind these metal plates with their rifles and their shotguns and they start opening fire on the McLean. The McLean, of course, is, is armed with a howitzer. So, and it's not afraid of some, you know, small wooden skipjacks. So what they end up doing is they just open her up, full steam ahead, she just plows right into this, you know, this entire rafted up flotilla of vessels. And almost immediately, one of them, the Mahoney, sinks. And so the Mahoney's sinking, and all the crew on the Mahoney are like jumping off and they're trying to get onto the steamer, and the steamer is not having it. The McLean backs up and goes full steam ahead again and rams into the, the, the flotilla a second time. And again, it's just all hell breaks loose. And you know, you have crew swimming away, and it turns out that later on that there's a bunch of Shanghai crew that had been, you know down drunk in a bar and they stuffed them into the hold of one of these skipjacks to impress them as you know to work on board as oystermen for later and maybe not get paid and maybe drown um and what happens is they all drown in the hold of the ship that sunk and so 
that's just one example of the types of conflicts that happen over and over and over. And you're, you're looking at these, these newspaper headlines from all around the country and, you know, people are opening up their newspapers in the morning, um, you know, in New York and Chicago and Baltimore and Washington reading all about these headlines. And they're accompanied with images like this. This could be of the McLean. Um, and it's showing that nighttime gun battle that you'd see happening on the waterways of the Chesapeake. Now, why don't we hear about the oyster wars anymore? Well, largely it's because at the turn of the 19th century, the oyster population started to drop precipitously because of overharvesting. And it, this was really a time period when there was so little regulation, you could, well, besides the oyster, you know, the state fishery force, you could harvest almost as much as you wanted. Um, this also happened at a time period when the oyster population starts to drop, but new technology like refrigeration makes it easier to catch crabs instead of only oysters or also fish instead of just oysters. So this is a time period when oystermen become watermen and the fishery becomes more diversified. And so there's less pressure to go out and shoot and kill to get as much access as oy to oysters as you, know, as you want. Um, now that you have the ability to go out and harvest something else to make money. So just as a side note, what ends up happening to the McLean. So the McLean goes on and is used in the Oyster Navy up until World War I when it's pressed into service as a uh, Coast Guard vessel um, during you know, World War I for the US government. Um, after that, um, the vessel ends up working out of the Chesapeake again and spends the, her last days there uh, docked at the um, BMI bulkhead and you can see what remains of her today, um, the last remnant from the shadows of the Oyster Wars of the Chesapeake. So thank you so much for listening today. I hope you learned a little bit. If you want to read more stories, you can always check out my book, uh, Chesapeake Oysters, the Bay's Foundation and Future. Um, I really enjoyed telling you all about the uh, wild and wooly adventures on the Chester River where I live. Um, and thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of your uh, bull and oyster roast.